Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew McColl and I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice Australia. Our subject today is civil liberties and Corona-19. I'm joined today by two panellists, Lorraine Finlay and Dr. Augusta Zimmerman. Lorraine commenced her term as Human Rights Commissioner on the 22nd of November 2021. Prior to joining the Commission, Lorraine has worked as a lawyer and academic, specialising in human rights and public law. Her most recent roles have been as a Senior Human Trafficking Specialist with the Australian Mission to ASEAN and as a law lecturer at Murdoch University. She has worked as a state prosecutor with the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in WA and at the High Court of Australia as a legal research officer and as a judge's associate. Lorraine currently lives in Canberra with her husband and two young children. Good afternoon, Lorraine. Just waiting for her to come on. And while I am, while we are waiting for Lorraine, I'll also introduce Dr. Augusta Zimmerman. He's Head of Law and Professor at Sheridan College in Perth and Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. He's a former Law Reform Commissioner with the Law Reform Commission of WA and has also served as Director of Postgraduate Research and Associate Dean at Murdoch University School of Law. He's also President of the Western Australian Legal Theory Association the Editor-in-Chief of the Western Australian Jurist Law Journal, and the author of numerous articles and books, including his three-volume collection on the Christian foundations of the common law, and his recent book, Emergency Powers, COVID-19 Restrictions, and Mandatory Vaccination. And I'll be making reference to that particular book at the end of our session today for those who would be interested in purchasing the book. Good afternoon, Augusta. Good, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Great to have you online. So just a couple of housekeeping matters before we start and just letting those who are listening and viewing us understand that at the end of our session in the last 20 minutes or so, we'll be taking questions from the public to Augusta or Lorraine. So if you think of a question that you'd like to put to one of our our panelists today just make a note of that and my colleague peter will collate those ready for later in our in our zoom session so just beginning with you augusto if we can you wrote in your book uh, the you, you wrote in your book emergency powers covid 19 restrictions in mandatory vaccination that and i quote since March 2020, Australia's governments have been using their powers to excessively coerce, obstruct, or otherwise unreasonably interfere with the life, liberty, movement, and property of the citizen. These governments are exercising emergency powers to impose measures that profoundly undermine basic principles of the rule of law. Professor Zimmerman, we've had a federal constitution since 1901, and I thought this would limit the power of our civil authorities. Has that occurred? Well, this is a very important question because uh, uh, Professor Gabriel Moyes and, and myself, and also, of course, I have written some articles with uh, Dr. Rocco Loyocano explaining that uh, there were certain provisions in the constitution that could potentially have been used in order to protect of fundamental rights and freedoms. We can refer, for instance, to the external affairs power, which could have been used in combination, of course, with uh, the external affairs power to, to be found in section 51. So uh, Professor Moyes in, in particular uh, was very helpful in uh, writing this book that you have mentioned, whereby we have uh, uh, in the book many chapters explaining from a constitutional law perspective, uh, how uh, the government could have done more to protect our fundamental rights and freedoms from a rule of law perspective. It's not just the provisions of the constitution that sometimes were ignored, 
but also a tradition of government under the rule of law and the idea that the purpose of the law is to protect our fundamental rights. And I didn't see this happening at all uh, at the beginning of this whole uh, COVID madness. I actually wrote a, a very clear letter to the prime minister uh, begging him to be moderate, begging him to not be extreme in his measures. But it seems that unfortunately the government didn't pay enough attention to what I had to say. And as a result, the name and reputation of this country has been seriously, seriously damaged and the rights of our fellow citizens undermined or uh, seriously affected. Okay, thank you. So you also mentioned, Augusta, that the High Court in assessing the constitutionality of these vaccine mandates should consider that the primary purpose of a constitution based on the principles of liberal democracy and representative government is the establishment of a system of checks and balances capable of limiting arbitrary power and ensuring the realization of the principle of legality known as the rule of law. Has the High Court done this? Well, not, not yet. We, we don't have these uh, at this point uh, being tested by the High Court. We have a very important case, for instance, uh, uh, occurring at this very moment at the level of the state WA uh, Supreme Court. And we expect that um, uh, eventually this case involving uh, police officers, several police officers, by the way, will be uh, entertained by the High Court on the basis of, uh, of course, a special leave. So when this happens, uh, I would expect the High Court to have a, a better approach to the protection of human rights and perhaps even rely on international human rights law in order to be uh, doing what the High Court is supposed to do, which is to uphold, as I mentioned, the rule of law and ultimately to protect the rights and freedoms of, uh, of the Australian people. It's very regrettable that some governments continue to use um, the excuse of a, of a, a pandemic to uh, increase the power and control over the society. And you have this uh, happening at this very moment, in my opinion, in Western Australia, whereby uh, the governor has just uh, am amended the legislation to turn what was supposed to be uh, per, uh, temporary measures into more permanent ones. And I can uh, discuss this matter later in more details. Thank you. So, so Lorraine, it's nice to see your face on our screen today. And if I can address this next question to you, just quoting from Augusta's book again, uh, Albert Van Dyce's definition of the rule of law encompasses three distinct uh, kindred conceptions, the absence of arbitrary power, equality before the law, the general principles of the constitution, especially the basic rights of the individual, such as freedom of speech and association are to be recognized and enforced by the courts. So with the COVID restrictions, Lorraine, can it be said that our political leaders to some degree cast aside the constitution. Well, could I start by just saying thank you so much for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be with you and I apologize for joining a little bit late. Um, and it's a particular pleasure to um, share this platform with my good friend, Professor Augusto Zimmerman. Although I should note, um, Augusto is still technically amongst us in a state of emergency today. So that doesn't end in Western Australia until Friday, which yes. you know is just a, good example of how these restrictions are continuing to have an impact right around the country. You know, it's extraordinary to think that a state in Australia is still technically in a state of emergency and has been for, you know, years at this point, which is um, incredible. Y you asked, um, can it be said our political leaders have cast aside the constitution? I wouldn't say cast aside. What I would say is this really highlights to me a core feature of the Australian Constitution that is worth reflecting on. And that's that when it comes to individual human rights, the framers didn't put a Bill of Rights into the Constitution. They didn't make the Constitution a document about individual rights. The Constitution instead is about 
governmental arrangements, and they really place considerable faith in the Westminster democratic system with a central role to be played by parliament against excesses or misuses of executive power. And I think over the past few years, what the pandemic has really highlighted in Australia is the sidelining of parliament, its failure to really step up and provide the oversight and accountability that you needed to protect individual rights, and also the rise of unelected bureaucrats in a way that was never envisaged by the constitution, which to my mind is really concerning because from a real rule of law perspective, it really undermines democracy, transparency, accountability, and those scrutiny mechanisms we rely on. And if I could just make one more point about, I think Dicey's rule of law definition, and when you reflect on um, what the rule of law means in terms of the role of the courts, I do think we need to be a little bit careful when we think about the role of the courts in relation to the pandemic and pandemic restrictions, because obviously they have an important role to play in judicial review and upholding the constitution. But when we start talking about drawing judicial implications and reading things into the constitution, or for example, using international human rights law to interpret the Australian constitution, I actually think we're really getting to te into territory where we perhaps have the danger of judicial, judicial activism creeping in. And so you need to be a little bit careful in terms of the roles that you want different um, branches of government to play, because in terms of a pandemic response, I certainly think we can be very critical of many of the things that happened in Australia and should be very critical about them. But I think responsibility for those decisions really lies with the democratically accountable branches of government and that they're the best placed to make these decisions um, about pandemic restrictions and to be held to account for them. Excellent, thank you. So Augusta, you mentioned in your book that as, as Noel Reynolds asserted, the rule of law does poorly in cultures where it is not the fundamental expectation that a people has of its government. If people do not expect the rule of law and insist on it when officials move to compromise its effect, it is soon corrupted and replaced by rule of will. Is that what's happened in Australia? It is what's happening in Australia. Uh, I have developed uh, on this theme in my PhD thesis, uh, uh, I was uh, awarded the PhD for a thesis on the legal and extra legal elements for the realization of the rule of law. And I can say with confidence that one of the preconditions for the rule of law is what I have described as a culture of legality, which is similar to what Ratnapala, Sur Ratnapala says in his constitutional law book as the need for a culture of constitutionalism. So in a certain sense, even when it took the constitution, you have to bear in mind that constitutions were designed for the idea of separating the powers of the state and to limiting the power of the state as a result so that uh, our individual rights and freedoms will be more properly protected. Uh, they didn't think the founders of this nation that it was even a need or there was a need for a bill of rights to be inserted into the body of the document. Our constitution is primarily a charter that separates the power, not only at vertical level so that we have state governments and federal government, but also at uh, the same level of government, we should definitely have a separation of the different branches of government. And this was completely violated during this whole uh, COVID madness, whereby the executive started to act as a legislator without a proper level of scrutiny. And therefore, uh, basic principles uh, derived from the West, Westminster system were entirely disregarded in the process. And they continue to be so, as Lorraine uh, so um, uh, authoritatively explained uh, as uh, something that has not ceased to exist, especially here in Western Australia. Thank you. So, so um, Lorraine, you, you, we, we talked about the constitution quite a bit in the last few minutes. And would you 
would you conclude that the constitutional protections, especially section 51, have been effectively circumvented with the restrictions of COVID-19 or have they actually been breached? Well, I think what it's shown is the limitations of what the constitution in Australia is designed to do in terms of human rights, because as Augusto pointed out, you know, the founders decided not to put a Bill of Rights into the Australian Constitution, not because they didn't think rights were important, but because they actually thought the best protection for human rights is a strong, robust parliamentary democracy with a separation of powers. And I think what the pandemic has shown is really how fragile some of those institutions are in Australia. And, um, you know, the risk of that scrutiny and oversight and accountability not being rigorously enforced. You know, and for example, if you put that into the context of the border closures, I wrote right back in July 2020 when the pandemic was, you know, right at sort of the beginning, um, that despite my personal views about border closures and whether you agree or disagree with borders being closed, I actually ultimately would prefer elected governments to be making those decisions rather than having the High Court determine whether or not borders could be closed. Because in my view, elected governments are best placed to be able to balance the various factors and to also adjust things as time goes by. Whereas when you have judges making those decisions, you get one answer at one point in time and it doesn't allow for the nuances that you actually need when you're dealing with a pandemic. And I think one of the real central <clears throat> difficulties when we talk about you know, Section 51 and constitutional protections that have come out in Australia in recent years is that what were originally meant to be emergency measures, you know, we were told initially two weeks to um, really just to allow us some time to figure out how we were going to deal with this emergency. Those measures became normalised and they stayed in place for an extended period without really compassion or humanity being built into a lot of those restrictions. And I think the other important point to recognise in relation to the constitutional discussion around border closures, particularly, is it wasn't just state borders that closed, we also had international borders closing, sure. um, which is really significant. I mean, for example, the fact that at one point, Australia actually criminalised the return of our own citizens um, is quite an extraordinary step to be taken. And not from a constitutional perspective, but from an international human rights law perspective, I'd have serious doubts about whether that measure in particular um, was actually consistent with international human rights. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Well, Augusta, you mentioned that in, in relation to, to Justice Kirby's ruling that compulsory vaccination destroys the contractual relationship between doctors and patients. And therefore, it imposes an impermissible obligation on people to accept a medical procedure, which they can refuse on constitutional grounds. Section 51 could thus also be regarded as as an implied constitutional right of individual patients to refuse vaccinations. You later claim that if governments cannot constitutionally force everyone to be vaccinated, they certainly cannot indirectly create a situation whereby everybody will be forced to take the vaccine. So clearly this advice has been ignored by state governments in a relation to COVID. Do we need more cases to go to the High Court? This is a very important question that is derived from my interpretation and I can say that uh, Professor Gabriel Moise assisted me in the process, which is to acknowledge the fact that uh, some implied freedoms have been in the past acknowledged by the High Court. And for instance, we know very well that um, as derived from a system of representative government, uh, there is something the High Court acknowledges to be as essential to the democratic representative system that we have in place, the implied freedom of political communication. But what I have to say regarding that particular provision is that it is uh, uh, determining that nobody should be subject to medical or pharmaceutical treatment uh, via civil conscription. And there were some decisions of the High Court, especially one in particular in the 1940s, explaining what uh, the provision actually means. And 
the statement that you have referred to was not really even expressed by me, Professor Gabriel Moyes, actually comes from the judicial ruling itself. It was uh, um, an opinion given by Justice Williams. And there were the judges explaining this matter in light of that provision. But above everything, we have to understand that it's not just about explicit provisions in the constitution, but it's about a common law tradition and a series of precedents that we can even uh, remote to uh, decisions made by the Privy Council uh, in England in the 19th century, uh, making it very clear that uh, nobody should be subject to a forced medical pharmaceutical treatment, which obviously includes mandatory vaccination. So um, I was just trying to remind uh, my colleagues in the legal profession that there is something in our common law tradition called the principle of bodily autonomy. And there is such a dangerous thing to be forcing people to take the same medical prescription in complete disregard of uh, age considerations and even health considerations. I think this is undermining the relationship between medical doctor and patient. And I know at this point, uh, by reading many academic articles on the subject, even published by the most prestigious publications in the world, including Harvard Medical Journal and Yale, that uh, some of these um, treatments are actually counterproductive and could lead to unintended consequences, especially because uh, the treatment is based on an experiment. So I have to, to alert the society about this. And certainly I am convinced that this would be ultimately an unconstitutional measure, but above all, a disregard for precedent and the common law tradition. Wow. Oh, that's a that's a fairly serious statement to make, <laughs> Professor Zimmerman. Well, thank you. So, Lorraine, um, Augusto has written that the fact is that the response to the spread of the novel coronavirus certainly struck a very heavy blow at democracy by undermining the rule of law and confidence that people have in the ruling classes, particularly in members of the legal, medical, and, and political professions. It has also fatally compromised the rights and freedoms of people and wrecking the economies of the free world. What seems to have been the attitude shown by our political leaders in the context of COVID and our civil liberties? Lorraine. Oh, thanks, Andrew. It's such an important question. If I could just go back, though, to make one quick comment on um, what Augusto was saying about vaccine mandates. And I hesitate because obviously Augusto and Gabriel, who we referred to as well, are eminent constitutional scholars whose views should always be listened to in terms of the Constitution. But I do have to admit, I take a different view in relation to the constitutionality of vaccine mandates. And I'm not convinced when you look back at the drafting history and the original um, intentions of the drafters of the amendment that um, was made in 1946, which is a constitutional provision Augusto relies on, I don't take the same view that it would um, result in vaccine mandates being unconstitutional. And further, have some real hesitancy about, again, encouraging judicial implications to be drawn from the constitution. Having said that, I do think there is a real discussion that needs to be had about the morality of vaccine mandates, particularly broad-based vaccine mandates. And the fact that something might be constitutional doesn't always mean it is correct or moral to do. So I think that is an important discussion to have. Um, having said that, um, you know, I think there is, let me start that again. There's an important discussion to have, but I actually think one of the really interesting things that's kind of been lost in the last few years is if we look at all the pre-pandemic planning that was done, there was discussion about the need for vaccination programs if there was a pandemic emergency, but there was often explicit reference in that planning that, to the fact that you want to have vaccinations by persuasion, not by mandate. And well, that's because of exactly what Augusta was talking about, about the 
the, the limits that vaccination mandates put on human rights and the restrictions it has on individual autonomy. So I really do think the vaccination mandate debate in Australia um, does need to be revisited, not so much from a constitutional perspective, but more from simply um, asking whether this is the right approach to take and whether a broad based mandate um, really achieves what we want it to achieve. So I think we end up probably in the same point, Augusto, but for different reasons. And in terms of the question you asked about the attitude shown by our political leaders, you know, what I think is really interesting is our political leaders would say that Australia had one of the best responses to COVID in the world and that what they were doing was protecting Australians. I think you can accept that Australia got some things right, but I think you can also um, hold that position while still acknowledging that the pandemic restrictions cost people an awful lot and there was a really significant price to pay, um, not only in terms of the effect on individuals and families, but on communities and on the nation as a whole. And I don't think this was limited to Australia. I mean, around the world, the Democracy Index 2020 described the COVID-19 response as the biggest rollback of individual freedoms ever undertaken by governments during peacetime. And actually in the first half of 2020, studies by some Swedish researchers have shown that over half the countries in the world impose states of emergency. So this is a really significant event in terms of what it tells us globally about human rights and freedoms. It's also an ongoing event because if you look at the continuing scenes from China, for example, as they continue to pursue zero COVID policies, it's actually really concerning how quickly and easily rights and freedoms so many of us took for granted um, were restricted and how feeble some of the safeguards we thought we had in place turned out to be. So I'm particularly worried about what it has shown us in terms of the weakened state of the parliament vis-a-vis -vis the executive and the undermining of democratic accountability through the rise of the experts, um, particularly with chief health officers assuming this enormous power over our lives, but without the accompanying transparency or accountability. And in saying that, I don't want to estimate, underestimate um, how challenging it would have been to be a political leader and have to make those decisions during the last few years. But I think there was a priority given to safety over liberty that really highlights how fragile our freedoms are in Australia. And I think that's something that emerging from the pandemic, we really should reflect on and think about how we can strengthen those institutions to ensure there are better protections when we face future emergencies. Thank you. Well, I think what I might do is, is put the next question to Augusto again, if I can, Augusto. You wrote that the former Premier of New South Wales has warned that unvaccinated people in New South Wales could be barred from locations and denied movement freedoms, even after the state achieves 80% double dose vaccination and that vaccine hesitant residents will not be able to let everybody else do the hard work and then turn up for equal freedoms. In the same vein, the former deputy of New South Wales boldly declared that businesses that accept unvaccinated people will be subject to exceptionally heavy fines. Private employers are encouraged to require their workforce to be vaccinated. These are draconian edicts. Now, what should individuals do, Augusto? Well, this is uh, something that uh, Professor Moyes and I describe as uh, the undermining of the idea that every single citizen in Australia should be treated in an equal fashion uh, before the law. And based on also uh, the uh, idea that we were not entirely sure uh, regarding the efficacy of these um, uh, vaccines. So now we know uh, uh, as to be a matter of fact that some people who are not uh, vaccinated suffer far less of the consequences of uh, acquiring the virus than those who uh, took at uh, even three jabs, I would say. And you know also that uh, some people are ha having serious health consequences of the choices they have made. I can tell you, and I think uh, you all know about this, that the death rate has increased after uh, the vaccine became compulsory. 
I think I have to be very careful about uh, saying these things because there is so much censorship that we are not uh, entirely free to express our opinions comfort comfortably on this subject. But I can tell you that this is absolutely regretful and despicable to be discriminating people who actually have a better sense of human rights than the others who are subject to these uh, measures by the government. I feel that those who resisted the temptation of keeping their jobs because they uh, measure their actions according to um, the idea that uh, they are free people and they have the right to have their own choices respected, I think these people must be honored and not persecuted. Because it reminds me in many ways what we witnessed in the past uh, via totalitarian regimes, when a segment of the society, for whatever reason, and normally they are unreasonable really, and um, irrational sometimes, are discriminated by the majority. And I was really, really upset with the fact that the premier here was even uh, using a dehumanizing language to refer to these bold and courageous people who didn't subject themselves to this uh, coercive measure, calling them drop kicks, for instance, calling them that they should grow a brain. That is actually dehumanizing. And I was absolutely shocked to see that um, this person seems to still have a reasonable popularity rate uh, kept intact. And that, um, in my opinion, reveals the state, the moral state of our fellow citizens. I think that we have indeed to, uh, when it comes uh, to uh, interacting with our elected politicians, require them a better level of civility. Thank you. You also quoted from John Locke, Augusta, when he wrote that whenever the legislators endeavor to take away and destroy the property of the people, i.e. their basic rights to life, liberty and property, or to reduce them to slavery under arbitrary power, they put themselves into a state of war with the people who are thereupon absolved from any further obedience and are left to the common refuge which God hath provided for all men against force and violence. You also comment that civil disobedience requires people to be able to think for themselves. Is this where we find ourselves today? Well, this is a, an important uh, a question because we know that John Locke not only was uh, the person who justified the Glorious Revolution in England. He wrote his two treatises uh, before uh, the advent of the Glorious Revolution, and he was in his exile in Amsterdam when he wrote these, these important treatises. Uh, and of course, uh, that was eventually used to justify uh, the actions of the parliament against a king who had, uh, I would say, authoritarian inclinations. But then on the falling century, the American founding fathers created the first written constitution in modern era, very much based on the principles of John Locke and Montesquieu. I would even go to the point to say that uh, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence in America, he was basically paraphrasing and summary what John Locke had stated in the second treatise, that the whole idea of having a law according to our uh, traditions in the West, is for the protection of inalienable rights, rights to life, liberty, and property. And every time the government violates these rights, John Locke would state that this government is acting in a tyrannical fashion. And that's why you, as a citizen, has the right to lawfully resist. Because by resisting tyranny, you are actually ultimately upholding the rule of law. Well, that's encouraging. You also quote uh, Hayek when he said that the conditions under which such emergency powers may be granted without creating the danger that they will be retained when the absolute necessity has passed are among the most difficult and important points a constitution must decide on. Uh, 
emergencies have always been the pretext on which the safeguards of individual liberty have been eroded. And once they are suspended, it is not difficult for anyone who has assumed such emergency powers to see to it that the emergency will persist. Do you think this is a danger today? Uh, of course it is. I think we should learn these uh, lessons from the past because no authoritarian regime will ever start as such promising to oppress you it's quite the other way around. They're going to tell you that they're going to protect you. And you know that um, governments uh, on, the, on the pretext of protecting you might very well ultimately destroy you because a government that's uh, powerful enough to offer such a level of protection, guess what? It's going to be powerful enough to also destroy your life. And this is a very dangerous thing that we are uh, taking a, a gamble here by giving uh, these authorities so much power and control over us. You know that in the 1930s, there was a particular society in Europe that was begging for protection. And the government of the day used the emergency powers renewable for 40 years. In the end of the day, they never returned the rights and freedoms of that people, including the Weimar constitution was not undermined and that tyrannical, evil, terribly oppressive regime ruled under a democratic constitution, much better in my opinion, in terms of protecting human rights than the Australian one. So what the, the risk that you are taking at this moment is that these uh, rights and freedoms, once they are taken away, it's very hard for these rights to ever be returned to the citizen by normal means. Well, thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Augusto and Lorraine. I'm going to refer to my colleague, Peter. Peter, do you have any, any questions coming in from our public for our two panellists? I do, uh, Andrew. Uh, I'll address the first one to Lorraine. Uh, how is it possible uh, for citizens to better protect our civil liberties? Well, it's a really good question. And again, if I could just jump in quickly, just to acknowledge you know, the points Augusto was making about um, mandates and about some of the challenges that there have been in terms of freedom of speech and allowing people to bring forward alternative views, I think are really important when we come to talk about how do we then better protect our civil liberties? Because one of the things that is really concerning, I think, is that over the last few years, we have seen the failure of civil discourse and the failure to respect differences of opinions and the failure to acknowledge that there might be alternative views about how to best manage some of these things. And I think that is really concerning. Having said that, I do take a different view to Augusto about the benefits of vaccination. You know, I think some of the statistics overall show that the benefits do outweigh the costs. And, you know, while I would acknowledge there have been in some cases very serious side effects and injuries and they're not without risk, I do think the overall benefits have been shown to outweigh the costs at a bigger level. Um, having said that, I think it's obviously preferable for vaccines to be um, encouraged rather than compelled. And one of the things that we do need to think about when we think about how do we better protect our liberties moving forward is in situations where we disagree with particular laws or we have concerns about particular laws, do we go down the road of civil disobedience, which raises a question of, well, then who gets to decide which laws are significant enough that we can disobey them? Um, and that really does lead you down a pathway to anarchy, I suppose, when every individual is making those decisions. Or alternatively, do we say, well, we have a democratic pathway we can go down? which provides us with ways for every individual to have their voice heard, to be able to put forward their opinions, to have that civil discourse. And so I actually see a really important outcome from the pandemic to be having us think about how our democratic institutions have worked or perhaps not worked as effectively as we'd want them to, and how can we strengthen them into the future? And I think we all have a role to play in that because one of the things that has really become clear over the last few years is that people feel very disconnected from their political leaders and their political institutions. And I think that growing level of distrust and disconnect is really concerning because it is, you know, breaking down the very fabric of our society. When you think back to the first few weeks of the pandemic, again, there was this sense of we're all in this together. 
that really disintegrated over time um, and I do think it's something that we need to need to address in terms of restoring that trust and that connectedness between people and the institutions that are at the end of the day meant to represent them. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, would a Royal Commission uh, help in uh, getting to the bottom of things and improving things, do you think? I think there needs to be an inquiry um, and I think a Royal Commission would be appropriate. One of the real concerns that I have is you're getting, for example, there was an independent inquiry um, a few weeks ago and the fault lines report that you can find um, online emerge from that. Western Australia, I note with the lifting of the emergency or state of emergency on Friday, they've announced there will be an inquiry in the fullness of time. The Prime Minister has said there will be an inquiry in the fullness of time. But what we actually need is a comprehensive inquiry that takes into account not just one or two jurisdictions, but how all of the state, territory, national restrictions work together and the totality of those impacts. Because I think what really um, is important is not just one rule here or one rule there, but the overall impact that the pandemic restrictions had on people. And it concerns me that what might happen if we have a lot of individual inquiries in individual states or territories that will never get the full picture in terms of understanding the overall impact. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, got a question for Augusto. Uh, how could we roll back the powers of unelected bureaucrats? This is a very important thing, but uh, before I, I touch this uh, important uh, point or, or matter of discussion, I would like just to say that my reservations about uh, coerced vaccination had nothing to do with this being on medical grounds. I was against this from the very beginning. And even before uh, I could now make my conclusion about um, the facts of this experiment, my concern was on human rights grounds and the fact that nobody should ever, ever be subject to this sort of coercion. It is just a very dangerous slippery slope when the state actually violates, grossly violates your bodily autonomy. I can't see a worse violation of human rights than that. But um, you mentioned about the bureaucrats uh, and the way they are acting. Well, this is a problem perhaps even caused by your judiciary, when it allows one of the branches of government that's not supposed to legislate to act as a legislator. So we have a serious problem here of proper separation of powers and ultimate undermining of West, the Westminster system when uh, you have chief health officers make such, such decisions. Uh, without uh, proper parliamentary scrutiny. And I find it outrageous as well that these um, members of the executive who control the parliament, thanks to the Westminster model, they control both branches of government as a result, now decide to appoint as the heads of the state, chief health advisors, and even a vaccine commander here in Western Australia. I just find it completely inappropriate. And I would love to see perhaps something to be done in this regard so that the executive will start to actually execute laws more than making them on a daily basis and changes the, changing the rules of the game on a regular basis. One of the main attributes of the rule of law for its realization is the fact that the law should be certain, they should be stable. And during this whole uh, thing, we saw uh, these health chief, chief health advisors uh, uh, issuing their executive decrees almost on a daily basis. So how can you actually have legal certainty and the guarantee of your rights being protected if now the executive can behave as an arbitrary legislator? So we have to really reconsider these issues and reestablish a proper system of checks and balances in this nation, a proper system of separation of powers. 
could I just add into that? Because one of the things I think that's important for people to understand is this isn't something that was limited to the immediate emergency period of the pandemic. Yes. If you look at Western Australia as a good example, new laws were passed, I think about three weeks ago now, or yes. that put in place sort of permanent measures to deal with emergency powers in future emergencies. And it gives extraordinary powers to the police commissioner to be able to declare an emergency without parliamentary oversight or scrutiny. That's yeah. an extraordinary undermining of the separation of powers and I think has real rule of law concerns. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Paul Lorraine. Uh, in your role as the Federal Human Rights Commissioner, is there anything that you can do to help our civil liberties? I hope so. Um, certainly, I've been only in the job since the very end of last year. And one of the first things that I said when I took on the role is that I really did want to focus on the impact of the pandemic on human rights. And I think probably the most important thing that needs to happen is for an inquiry to actually reflect back and understand exactly what happened, because there were so many rule changes and so many restrictions that I think it's actually been really hard for people to get a full understanding of just how comprehensive the restrictions on human rights have been. So I initially called for inquiry in the hope that this was something that could happen at a comprehensive national level with all state, territory, national governments coming together to ensure there was a comprehensive inquiry. Because again, the thing that worries me, the only thing that worries me more than not having an inquiry is having an insubstantial, insufficient inquiry that doesn't actually get to the heart of the matter. So I um, am heartened by the statements that there will be something happening in the fullness of time, but I don't think that's sufficient. And certainly within the Human Rights Commission, we do have um, powers to conduct our own reviews and inquiries. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm taking a very close look at because I do think if there isn't going to be an inquiry put in place by governments, then there really does need to be something put in place by other agencies or organisations to make sure we do have that proper reflection. And um, it really does concern me that we know there are going to be future emergencies. And I worry that we haven't learned the lessons we need to learn and this could all very well happen again. Oh, thank you, Lorraine. I have another question. Uh, is it not the case that the federal government's attempts during the pandemic to prevent Australians overseas from returning to Australia was achieved indirectly by placing a weekly limit on the number of passenger airlines could land unlawfully. And that if a citizen had managed to return to Australia by his own means, for example, by private boat or plane, the government would have been powerless to act. So the government's ban on returning citizens was based on a gigantic legal bluff. Perhaps so Augusto might want to start off on that one. I haven't thought about these, uh, uh... Uh, hypothesis, but uh, certainly it was um, a terrible thing to see some of our fellow citizens desperately trying to return to their country. I remember that uh, I had a conversation with a fellow academic, I prefer not to refer to his name, who was actually uh, in Hungary because his father had passed away and he therefore was there to attend his funeral. He ended up uh, not being able to return and spent uh, months in Hungary helping fellow citizens who had run out of money and were about to live on the streets of Budapest. There was a case of uh, a lady who had, uh, had the misfortune of um, attending a conference in Ireland when the, the borders were closed. And when she arrived in London, she sought the assistance of the embassy and they referred uh, to her the homeless shelter, saying that it would be an appropriate uh, uh, place to find accommodation, a homeless shelter. So that's the way the Australian government was treating uh, us as citizens. Uh, and that was really, terrible for our image and reputation, because even uh, my friends overseas were asking if I felt safe living in Australia after they witnessed all those abuse, arbitrary abuses of power committed, especially by the Victorian police, whereby even a pregnant woman uh, was arrested in front of her child 
because she dared to post something the government was not uh, happy to hear. So she, her house was stormed. The police handcuffed her without even a warrant. So all these things really were very gross violations of human rights and should not, not never ever have had uh, uh, such an occurrence in this country. So it was really regrettable. Could I just add on to that very briefly, Peter, in relation to was it a legal bluff? Uh, no, it wasn't in the sense that there were laws passed that criminalized people returning to the country. So, yeah. you know, I, I think a lot of Australians don't actually realize how extraordinary some of the regulatory mechanisms that were put in place were. And, you know, this isn't to, again, undermine or cast aspersions on for example, the consular officials from DFAT, who I know did in many cases extraordinary work in trying to assist Australians, but the simple fact is there were so many cases of people who were left in impossible circumstances who had heartbreaking stories about not being able to either get into Australia or to leave Australia. And what's really um, concerning to me is, for example, there's currently an inquiry in the parliament looking at DFAT's role in um, repatriating Australians during the pandemic. And that's based on an ANAO report into DFAT's management of the return of Australians. And it points to a lot of really hard work that went on in terms of numbers of flights and the amount of money spent and the number of hours that were spent really trying to assist people. What it doesn't do is look at the human rights impacts and look at the actual effect this had on individual human beings. It's all done through the prism of there were management plans in place and these bureaucratic processes and this much money was spent in this number of flights, but the individual stories aren't being told. And so the Human Rights Commission is putting a submission into that inquiry to make that point. The fact is, we can't lose sight of the fact that when we're talking about, you know, there were X number of Australians who were trapped outside of Australia and unable to return. Each one of those is an individual human being who has family, who have friends, who actually have a life that was affected by this. And that human cost is something that I don't think we've really grasped. Uh, thank you. The, the last question I've got is, um, can we have some more information on what's happening in Western Australia and how is this possible? It's very regrettable, but uh, what I have to say above all, is that these sort of things, they don't start in one single day. The price of liberty, I, like, I love to say this because it's true. The price, price of liberty is eternal vigilance. And in many ways, um, we were not vigilant enough. You see that the state um, government in Australia was returned with so much support of the population. It, it seemed to me that the worse they behaved, the more popular they would become. And so this is a very disturbing thing to think about that people love to have a powerful government to protect them. But then um, some politicians can easily capitalize on that. And you know that um, Lord Acton was very clear when he mentioned uh, uh, the fact that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what's happening, it's not, shouldn't be a surprise because I was writing from the very beginning. I feel like quite of a prophetic voice because I was expecting this uh, to become permanent. I was quoting Hayek from the very beginning that these uh, temporary measures, they inevitably have a tendency to become more permanent ones. And now, uh, just to confirm that you are becoming really a police state, it's not enough that we have a former police commissioner as a, our a governor, but the police commissioner who is now exercising the job will be able to decree a state of emergency without proper parliamentary uh, par scrutiny, if I can use the word. Uh, he can do it uh, at will. And this emergency measure you have a validity now of up to two years. And then some people are going to say, well, perhaps uh, it's not so bad. I think it's terrible two years, but um, nothing is really uh, uh, pre precluding, if I can say, the government to renew this for another further two years. 
And the use of emergency powers for four years, for, for instance, that they don't really mean that this will be used for only two years. It can actually go forever. And it's just uh, the renewal that uh, would ultimately be necessary. And before I have to conclude, the use of the emergency powers can serve very arbitrary uh, means. You know that now the so-called authorized officers, whoever they might be, can storm your property, can even potentially destroy them. And the law talks about something as things that can be um, uh, at the possession of this person who is the authorized officer. They can block roads. They can arrest people by preventing them from leaving their properties without a warrant. So if that is not a police state, for God's sake, I don't know what it might be. Can I just add a couple of quick points onto that? The first is just to acknowledge this isn't just Western Australia. You know, there have been further emergency laws passed in terms of the use of emergency powers in places like Victoria, for example. Yeah. And these laws deserve really serious scrutiny because on the one hand, people say, oh, you don't need to worry about them because these are powers that are not going to be used day to day. That might be true, but that's exactly what was said when the Biosecurity Act amendments were introduced into the Commonwealth Parliament back in 2015, and those were the powers that were then used during the pandemic. And parliamentarians who passed those amendments then said, oh, we didn't realise how restrictive they were and how much power they gave individual ministers. But they were there in black and white and nobody really thought them through. And I think as well in Western Australia, the thing that is really extraordinary is an act that has such potential capacity to restrict individual human rights and to really change the way um, society works during an emergency passed through Parliament in the Legislative Assembly on the same day it was introduced and in the Legislative Council there were two days of debate and the government refused to refer the legislation to a committee. I just think that's extraordinary in terms of such a lack of scrutiny being applied to a law that is quite extraordinary in its potential reach and the potential impact it will have on individuals. Well, thank you. Thank you to both of you today, Professor Zimmerman and, sorry, Lorraine Zimmerman. I'll get my name back the front here. Lorraine Finlay and Professor Zimmerman for your worthwhile and learned contributions today. I'm confident for those listeners that they've appreciated your valuable comments. Professor Zimmerman's book, Emergency Powers, COVID-19 Restrictions and Mandatory Vaccination is available at sales at connorcourt.com for $29.95. That's Emergency Powers, COVID-19 Restrictions and Mandatory Vaccination found at sales at connorcourt.com for $29.95. Thank you to all for sharing in our Zoom session today.